Bullshit. You have something to add? Me? Yeah, I do. Look, your biggest athletes, right? Movie stars. Hell, guys, my president is black. Okay, sometimes I think the hardest thing to be in the American workforce right now is an educated white guy. <laughs> what? Peter, who's your favorite basketball player? Magic Johnson. Who's your favorite movie star? Eddie Murphy. Who's your favorite rock star? Prince. Your Prince Ross. Bruce. Prince. Bruce. Pino, all you ever talk about is this and that. And all your favorite people are so called. It's different. Magic, Eddie, Prince. I'm not. I mean, you're not black. I mean. Let me explain myself. They're, they're not really black. I mean, they're black, but they're not really black. They're, they're more than black. It's, it's, it's different. It's different. Yeah, to me, it's, it's different. I love Dr. King. I love MLK. Man, he's he's my guy. He's he's. I mean, I, I love all black people. That's you know. I mean, if if, if I if I could take all the black people in the world and just you know just buy a farm somewhere and and let them all. Uh, well, you know what? That uh, actually that didn't really come out right. My name is Keith Gilbert. I am currently working on the fringes as a substitute teacher, as a tennis coach, as a writer, as anything else I can kind of get a handle on. And uh, Caucasian, Jewish. Uh, my name is Bill Stanton. Um, I currently work at um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. It's an association. Um, I've worked at associations basically since I got out of college. Um, so I guess you would just consider me an association professional. Um, I consider myself white, um, but I think that's a more complicated conversation <laughs> um, because I think there's a lot more going on than just having to be white or African-American or black or anything else. Hi, my name is Alicia Whittington. I am a research scientist, a healthcare consultant, musician, and I identify as black. However, I put a little asterisk there because of my complex family history. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcos Kraft. I am a technical director at Univision Chicago uh, News Network, and I identify as Latino, but um, I'm adopted. I was adopted by uh, two Caucasian parents my mother was born in Germany. So uh, I was raised in a German household. Um, so uh, like our other friends, I'll leave it there. We'll get into it later if uh, if uh, the conversation goes. So that's all I got for right now. Well, I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez and um, I identify as Mexican and Mexican American. Uh, uh, and yeah, that's all uh, I guess could be a bit complicated too um and what i do for a living is um how i earn my living right now is i'm an organizer with the chicago religious, religious leadership network in latin america uh, but i'm a writer as well um i write on my own time and that's one of my passions to go on uh to go on a little bit on that um Ms. Whittington, what you said was, is very interesting because there is a song that I um, discovered a couple years back um, that was done by Bone Thugs and Harmony. Um, <laughs> my, my favorite group. My favorite group. Yeah. <laughs> I'll listen to them. Thanks Kevin for us, thinks Robert. I don't know about them, by the way. Yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> um, so they did a song with Akon, and it's called I Tried. And this song is incredibly powerful because it is a song about basically the chorus is pretty much, I tried to get out of the troubled area, but wherever I go, trouble seems to follow me. 
and that is very that that is very clear with Latinos when you know they say they start a business and sell it and then they make a lot of money and then they go to someplace else those problems still follow them same unfortunately with black people anybody um, you know it's you come from the ghetto unfortunately it seems that the system that we live in forces those problems to follow you and a lot of those problems are coming from the laws that are constantly changing to not favor colored people um, you know to that um, just like in that video um, the the video that you, that you had us watch Kevin um, how when people discover oh so this is how that law is uh, set up so it doesn't favor us ah we've caught on okay then the people that the, then the, the powers that be then they're like oh okay so they know it now all right let's change the laws again so it's kind of we leave the situation we leave the barrio we leave the ghetto unfortunately because of our racist system that we have the troubles you can follow. well just to piggyback that i mean a, a cursory cursory search will show you that like there's like one one or two black representatives in the house zero in the senate in terms of people of color like in the, in the representation of the it doesn't make sense. I mean, the numbers don't even stack up. And just to connect that to, again, gerrymandering and redlining is a, just a tough, it's a tough connect. And right. most people can't do that and to vote and to vote in their interest to change that. Oh. Well, and we, so, we, we forget, oh, so good. Too, I was just going to say, we forget too that it's like, I hate that we always just use the terms yeah, that and, and and as Marco said, like barrio, because that's a you know a Latin version of it. But we say ghetto, and what we mean when we say ghetto is we mean black poor neighborhood. Is what we mean when we say ghetto. Do you know how many freaking areas of the country have white poor, you know, living in trailers? Like they're ghettos, but it's like we, it's like that's okay. Like that's sort of the heart of the country. Like, that, that's the, the origin of the word isn't the origin of the word ghetto from Jewish ghettos. In, uh, I mean, that is the origin of the that's, word. That's, uh, I think in a, it's an Italian term actually for like the Jewish quarters in Rome, where they were, where mm. Jews were pushed out to. And we use we use that term like it's, like it's just specifically black. Like it's 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 the term for a poor black neighborhood is the ghetto and it's like that's part of the problem because that's, it's just sorry no no no, no, no. You're, you're, um, you're good, bro. You're good. De and definitely hold on to that because i definitely want to come back to that the jane elliott thing now I, i've actually seen this a few times i saw it with these students and i saw another one that i think they did in england with uh uh just regular just adults are you angry no. Oh, good for you. Are you angry? Trying not to. Trying not to be. Now, does that take a lot of energy? Yes. Yes. Are you holding it in? Yes. Yes. And are you trying really, really hard not to react to me? Yes. Yes. And are you trying really hard not to look at me? At the moment, yes. Yes. Why? Because I don't want to make myself more upset. You don't want to make yourself more upset by looking at me? Yes. Right. Does that take a lot of time, a lot of energy? Yes. Yes. Is that hard for you? Yes. Could you develop an ulcer over this? No. If you had to do it every day, what would happen to your blood pressure? It would rise. Yeah. If somebody stood over you and you knew it was going to happen every day, or you expected it to happen every day, or it happened when you didn't expect it to, or it happened to your kids every day, after it happened to your mother every day, now, getting right along, your hand is still up. You still didn't learn anything, did you? Didn't I just say, when your hand is up, you are thinking of what you're going to say instead of what's being said? Didn't I just say that? Yes, you did. And did you hear that? Yes, I did. And did you decide that you were just going to do it your way? I was Wait a minute, you were on a roll yes, there for I a minute. Yes, I did. That, thank you very yes, much. Yes, wow. I did. Now, since you choose to not listen to others, what do you suppose we're going to do where you're concerned? Not listen to me. Thank you very much.
Finish now, what now, I'm no, because you're still thinking of what you're going to say instead of what I'm saying. Now, getting right along. I heard what you well, were every, saying. You're doing I it again. What you were you're saying. doing it again. I don't care. You're doing it again. It's wrong. You're you doing it again. Persecuted her for standing you're out. You're doing it again. Persecuted him for standing out. The only change that ever happens is when people stand out and all of us have Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Are you in any physical danger here? Are you in any physical danger here? Is that girl in any physical danger here? Emmett Till was hanged by his neck after he was beaten almost to death simply because he said, made a statement to a white woman. Uh-uh. <coughs> uh-uh. No. No, no, you don't come back in here until you've apologized to every person in this room because you just exercised a freedom that none of these people of color have. When these people of color get tired of, ra of racism, they can't just walk out because there's no place in this country where they aren't going to be exposed to racism. They can't even stay in their own homes and not be exposed to racism if they turn on the television. But you, as a white female, when you get tired of being judged and treated unfairly on the basis of your eye color, you can walk out that door. And you know it won't happen out there. You exercise the freedom they don't have. If you're going to be in here, you're going to apologize to every black person in this room. And do it now. I'm and sorry. the Latinos. Every there person of racism, color. There is racism in this country. Bullshit. No, you're not going to say, I'm sorry, there's racism. You're going to apologize for what you just did. I will not apologize because it Out. is not a matter of Out. race always. Out. Out. <clears throat> now, is she choosing to leave? Yes. yes. She could apologize and stay. I won't play the wrong game anymore. It's not going to hurt her to apologize. Yeah, let's talk Anything about that. What's going on in this room alone? Once she leaves it, that's it. It's over with. Okay. They ain't going to hurt her. Is it going to hurt her? She, according to her action, it is killing, it's killing her. Yeah, it's killing her. It's killing her. And I guess my question is, I've never, I've never been a part of a, this actual experiment, but do you think this was effective? Do you think that immersing both uh, black or black, Latino, black people of color and white people in an experiment like this is effective? I thought they were, honestly, I thought like the people of color that were like on the outside, like watching this happen, they were kind of like, oh damn, like they're kind of getting it a little bit. Like, they're starting to understand what it's like to like, have to deal with this crap. But it's also almost like, it's so depressing. It's so depressing because it's just like, man, like, it, it sort of forces you to like, understand that God, like this is a lifestyle for them rather than an experiment for two hours for like someone. And that's just so, as like someone that doesn't deal with it, that's so heavy to try and like comprehend. I was just so depressed. I'm just like, this is too much. Like I can't even deal with this. And they deep and this is a constant for the people that are dealing with it. I just it was so depressing. It was to the level of just like I, I don't I don't like I had to like stop and just be like, I can't. I think it, it, it definitely has That's impact. the definition of privilege. Right. It has oh. impact. Because <laughs> any single one of those kids could just flip their watch over and go, all right, I'm out in ninety. <laughs> right. well, 90 I'm, you know I'm, I'm going to the pub I'm gonna have a drink you know so but but for the moment for the moment to realize that you know you're blue eyed and you're bad and period and then for that two and a half hours to realize that just because you have blue eyes you know you are gonna be a societal pariah or whatever however you want to phrase it I mean in a moment that that can have impact I don't know like I'd be curious to see the research papers that came out of that or the, 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 you know, if anyone wrote that up as their experience afterwards. You know, um, that, that experiment made me um, reflect on my own experience growing up. And, um, and I think an experiment like that could be effective at least at getting some folks' attention. But I think, um, I think 
change is slow and change can be very painful and but um and i go back to the engagement and relationship building i think what how we change is through relationships and when we don't live together obviously because of a variety of reasons it's hard to uh, have relationships in life and what that made, made me remember of seeing that experiment was when i was in high school i was in um uh the upward bound program i don't know if anybody's ever heard of it it's a federal it, it's a federal program that uh encourages um folks from working class backgrounds to go to college you know you um you have to apply when you're in high school and you, you know and then when you get in my particular group from this area we went down to Purdue University um and we were all we were we were black folks we were brown folks we were um, white, white folks and we all had were together you know we were put all together and we engaged each other as classmates as as friends um Well, our roommates were not of the same race. Um, we spoke about issues of, of race and racism um, over the course of our summer while we were doing these like advanced um, high school. Uh, like I don't even know if they called them advanced placement back back then um, in the late '80s, early '90s. But um, we were we were reading books about apartheid. Um, but uh, you know, all these conversations and uh, were. Taking place over the course of, I think, six weeks, and we were all together. And I still remember that summer so profoundly because it was so meaningful. We were we we saw each other as um, and we got to know each other as friends. Um, you know, and and we had difficult conversations, right? Because we because we had experienced racism in our own particular and different way. Um, and maybe we didn't even, if we saw black folks that we didn't fully engage with, or or black folks didn't see, you know, Latino folks that we didn't fully engage with or understand their experience, we we came to some understanding. But I, that was a, a beginning, and I think that was really, for me, it was really meaningful and, and transforming. Um, I was 16, you know, um, this was the first time away from home, and for a very long time, for an extended period of time. And, but it was just the beginning, and I think that's what we require. We require, I, my opinion is, uh, relationships. So my question to you, and my thought is, how do we build relationships beyond our circle of friends, beyond those that we might be comfortable with, to actually walk alongside our brothers and sisters? You know, how do we listen to them? How do we try to understand as best we can? How can we have dinner with them? Have conversations with them, go to church with them, or um, whatever it might be, so that these relationships can grow. I'm not exactly sure if it worked. I thought it was fascinating how she was just so rude and just abrupt. And she said, you know, the system is this way. Um, and here's where I kind of struggle a little bit. So afterwards, or like halfway into it, she starts talking about, well, she gives some of the historical context of the different cases where people were murdered. And there was the young man, I forget his name. And she framed the conversation as he had the misfortune of being born gay. Uh, so when you Matthew think about- Shepherd. Matthew yeah, Shepard. Thank you. Um, when you think about marginalized groups or, um, those who have experienced oppression for whatever reason, like how you speak of them is really important, especially when you're trying to educate people that have minimal interaction or just don't know. Right. I, Because what you don't want to do is further stigmatize or, you know, right. you know, make someone's life that much more difficult because you're a person of influence. Right, I mean, now I don't mean, I don't mean to cut you off, Alicia, but mm -hmm. I saw that too. And I think she was probably being facetious, but just like I you said- I hope so, because- No, and, I, and I've seen other videos with her. I saw her Red Table Talk with Jada Pinkett. So like, I'm pretty sure she was being facetious in that moment. But I think what you said, which is also very valid is, 
some of these people are probably not going to pick up on subtlety like that. You know what I'm saying? And subtlety is not their strong suit. So go ahead. No. And in 2020, I have had people reach out to me about what Juan uh, Carlos was talking about, like how do they make friends outside of their communities because they don't know any black people. They don't have any friends that aren't white, which I think is so interesting because, you know, trying to be the best scientist that I can possibly be, I need to understand everyone, you know, in the context of health. And so I've never had that sort of privilege to just being in, you know, all of these rooms and there's nothing but black people. Like, I've always had to sort of, you know, spread my wings. Yeah, but that helps when you're one of the smartest people in the room. Heard <laughs> these rumors. It makes it it makes it easier when you're that smart. But you know what? Like <laughs> that's something that's really interesting too, because when I walk into rooms and I have out here in the Northeast, I have an accent. And since I spent some time in the South, people think it's more Southern. People make assumptions about me mm -hmm. as I walk into the room. Um, as a scientist, you know, when I start to talk about the issues and, you know, flex my intellectual muscle a little bit, then they're like, whoa, because they've never seen it before. But at the same time, I think that, um, I don't think that it's anything in particular that I did. Like, I don't think I'm special. I do think what I have is a God-given gift But then my parents, they nurtured the gift. And then I've had like supportive friends like Kevin, who doesn't tell the truth, um, <laughs> that have helped me get here because it's, it's difficult because like no one is trying to just give you the opportunities. Like I've been through multiple degree programs. I saw other people like, you know, having different experiences and I have to work that much harder. I see my wife, honestly, I, I, I wasn't gonna bring it up on this podcast, but I guess like it's there. Uh, I see my wife at, at the sexism level that is out there is, is absolutely a deal and it's, She's a very intelligent, very successful, but also petite, like attractive, like girl. And because she's an attractive, like small woman, it's like she apparently can't be smart. She's just not allowed to be smart. And every time she walks into a room, she has to deal with men that are less intelligent than her talking down to her every single time. And it's just like, and you have it now twofold. You have like a yeah, woman intersectionality. A color. Like yeah. and Kevin, you need to do a whole other podcast on mansplaining. Thank you for that. Kevin has had a no, million no. conversations about this. And also I have six brothers. So oh my gosh. Yeah, I could go on and on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sure, sure, I'm you, know, sure you could. But I'm you know sure what you could. But you know what's funny is um and I and this is not to, to minimize anything anyone said, but I remember, and this is, and I remember I had an internship at a radio station uh, when I was in college. And uh, black radio station, urban radio station, everyone there for the most part was black. My supervisor was black. And I had the summer, had a, a good summer work for them. And so they had like a, a final debrief. And I, I will never, ever forget that. The guy brought me in, he said, Kevin, you know, we had a really good summer. You know, we, we were struck by how intelligent you are because we wouldn't have necessarily thought, this is a black man. You know, we wouldn't have thought, uh, you know, you would be as you know, articulate, well-spoken as you are, but you really are. We really appreciate your you know, bringing talents to, and I won't say the, the radio station, but, um, that was that's internalized. You know what I'm saying? Like, why wouldn't you have a college educated person be intelligent working? Like, you hired me. I would I would not be smart. You know what I'm saying? But uh You're not but, a sympathy hire. Right, right, right. right. Must have been your good looks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so real fast, for me, the Jane Elliott video, um, it struck me as, uh, on a couple of different levels. Um, real fast. Um 
A, I think with these kind of experiments to expose um, the differences of race and everything like that, that there's ever going to be a perfect experiment that is, that can that can totally expose the problems of race. Um, and as well, um, from what everybody says in the experiment, uh, be it the, the people that are the subjects in the experiment or the person conducting the experiment, th th there's no way that everyone is going to say everything correctly that at the end of the experiment, all people that were uninformed are now completely informed and uh, and everything is covered i mean because it, just look at our conversation so far our conversation so far has been what like almost 50 minutes more or less and our our conversation has been such a wonderful conversation but yet it's our conversation is like the size of a grain of sand along the beach of an ocean I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to cover everything. And people that listen to this conversation, I'm fairly certain that, you know, it's going to open some eyes, but it's not going to fully cover everything that we need to. Um, I think to. To circle back, I mean, I think that's what I was talking about with the, with the shock of that George Floyd murder video. It's because you're distilling everything into, like, a minute and a half. Eight minutes and forty six seconds. Yeah, it, that's right. You're you're just yeah. still it all. I mean, it was right there. I mean, that it's not that. So in your reaction to that to that site is sort of like the cultural experiment. I mean, happening in real time. And I found that to be like as I'm watching it, I'm I'm feeling like like a combination of things are never going to be the same. As my heart was just sinking in my chest at the same time. And I can't, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the way that feels. But when you take a, an experiment full of, I think you can argue that, you know, they're in college, so they're at least enjoying a certain level of privilege. You know, so, um, so but to, and then to have someone take their best crack at it. And I think that, that that's what Jane was doing. You know, she, as she's developing, I mean, if we, if we talk about allyship and things like that. I mean, she, through a lot of intellectual weight at her experiment and to and as you were saying no it's not possible to replicate the systemic racism in a two and a half hour experiment but there's no way that you can leave that experiment without having to at least make an adjustment in something that's true that's very true but good call good call Right. No, but I agree with I agree with Marcus though on the idea that it's like, wow, like you got a room full of like thirty people and it's like, great, like now what? Like, can you expand this into like something bigger? No, you can't. And so it almost is more like depressing because it's like, great, you got a room full of kids that now understand on some level, like what like racism is and what you know discrimination is. But again, like, if you really think about it, what is the bigger picture? Like, you could say that maybe she expands it because we're watching the video and talking about it. So, yeah, it has an effect. But, like, in the end, it's like the, the people that were affected by it, they go right back to their normal lives. You know what I mean? It doesn't do much for the the people of color that are in there. They're like, haha, those, those kids got to see it for two hours. Great. Like... Now they get to go back and be their normal selves, which is not dealing with it. Mm -hmm. it's like to, to piggyback on what you just said, Bill, um, I I've had this kind of uh, this kind of discussion before about how mm, colored people we can't really escape this mm -hmm. um, because I've had I, I, I I've had a lot of white friends um, and even family members that have said, I have felt racism. And they said that to me. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You've never felt racism. And they say, yes, I have. And then they, 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 they fire off everything that was said to them. Like, no, 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 no. What you felt was bigotry. The difference is 
once you go out into society, that bigotry melts away because society has will remind you, no, your race is the favored race. Right. Yep. Protect you. Unlike us, no. We have to we we can't just quit at any point. We can't mm-hmm. stop being colored. Right. And when we go out into public, that's the difference between bigotry and racism. Society will remind me, no, you're colored. Know your place and stay in the lines. Otherwise, immutable characteristics. Incarceration. So do you think that, that the Jane, that, 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 that the video, we can, I think we could say that it was, it was seed planting. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Minimum, right? I mean, we could agree that, you know, the, the, the long-term impact of it is we don't really know. But yeah. we could, once you've been in there, you've been exposed to the concept. Right. And, like, and, I, and I think, and I, don't mean to, I don't mean, and I don't mean to step on either one of you, but I, I think that's the thing with the Jane Elliott. I haven't talked to her, so I don't know, but I think it's, you will never get to experience this unless we put you in kind of the racial instant pot that we're putting you in right now. You know what I mean? So like, um, but I wanted to go back. The one thing I wanted to talk about, and we've been on for almost an hour and I really appreciate everybody. And the one thing I wanted to talk about, JC seems to be having connections issues, but so Mark, I'm gonna lean on you and Alicia, I'm gonna lean on you a little bit. Uh, I know when we talk about racism in this country, we talk about race in this country, it usually is in a very binary kind of context. We have black on one side, white on the other side. But clearly, uh, race in this country is not just about black and white, or African Americans and white people. We have Latinos, we have Asians, we have... Uh, Muslim, you know, different uh, diversity as it relates to religion, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. Um, I guess, Mark, since since uh, JC is not uh, connecting real well, do you feel that the conversation in terms of race, do you feel that, I guess, your vantage point is included? When we have these dialogues, or do you feel like more of an effort needs to be made to include everyone's vantage point as well as the race in discussion? Um, I do. I mean, you wait. You're talking me personally. Well, I, I guess just not. I guess just generally, do you feel that in kind of the binary black versus white, do you feel that the Latino uh, perspective is 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 kind of recognized and, and, and kind of put into the, into the discussion. Um, okay, so I do agree that yes, it has brought a light to it. Um, and But then as well, I also, I do want to point out that not every single struggle that Latinos face are the struggles that black people face. Because African Americans in this country um, that were, say, born, raised here, um, citizens have been here for generations, you guys don't have to worry about um, si necesito hablar en español. People are going to be like, hey, 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 he's speaking that, he's speaking that Mexican language. Uh, <laughs> uh, is he, does he have papers? Um, but then again, as well, we also, as Latinos, don't face problems that you guys face. Um, so I do feel that it has included a little bit, but um, to say that we're, that the African Americans and Latinos problems are, you know, identical. No, it's it's not identical, but at least we know um, generally, you know, we now go hand in hand and we can see now clearly a lot of, you know, Latinos that are saying, hey, black lives matter, black lives matter. Um, partially because, you know, a lot of Latinos, we do see that it's like, hey, you know what? A lot of your struggles, we're going to 
So when we say Black Lives Matter, we're kind of including ourselves in it, if that makes sense. Um, even though our problems aren't necessarily 100% aligned, but, um, you know, and then also on the flip side, I've seen a lot of Latino, or I'm sorry, a lot of African-Americans say, um, you know, we're no, we're standing up for the rights of Latinos because we know what they are going through with, you know, there are parallels in between the children in cages and also African slaves kidnapped from Africa and brought over here to the United States way back when uh, for slavery there, I mean, the, the, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities in those two. So um, I do see both uh, black and Latino and then also Asian to Muslim, um, you know, a lot of them sticking up for each other. And then also bringing in whites who do understand at least, or at least want to understand the, the, the trials of it. Um, they're kind of that, that core of people understanding is starting to get a little bit bigger. That, at least that's what I think. Yeah, I think, um, I think when one thing that has come about and, and that, that's made me reflect a lot is, you know, the, the toppling of all these monuments, um, has made me think about U.S. history a little more deeply. Um, and not that I haven't, you know, my mom was a teacher in Mexico, so she brought me up with a lot of the knowledge of, of uh, Mexican history. And as I went through high school and college, you know, a lot of Mexican-American studies courses. Um, but one thing I think that the conversation we need to have, and I think the toppling of this specifically of the Christopher Columbus statue, um, point to is that U.S. history is very much tied to um, to Latin American history, to especially in the Caribbean and, and Central America and Mexico, um, and the relationship between the United States and those countries and those people. Um, you know, we uh, we know that we're, we we're given a whitewashed sense of history of um, this great mighty nation of freedom but when it came up it, when it started butting up against the native peoples or or exactly or um, diminished the numbers of native people so much obviously it was bringing in slaves obviously the Spanish Empire had done that but and then the conquest of what were once Mexican territories and then also the intervention in Central America in, in, and in countries in the Caribbean, Cuba, Haiti, um, the Dominican Republic, um, El Salvador, Guatemala, you know. Salvador. Right. All these countries that have had have had for decades or almost you know centuries to deal with US intervention and then those those peoples it coming into this country, seeking in refuge in a country which hasn't created, been not entirely responsible, but certainly shared a lot of responsibility for the issues going on in those countries. Um, I, I think that that part that I think needs also to be part of the conversation, um, because you know I, I reflect on I, on the drug war and how the, about something very specific, the drug war and how it's. Uh, the mass incarceration it's caused here in the United States, especially with with Black folks, right? Um, most uh, most people in prison in this country, unfortunately, have been um, Black males, right? And and then I think about the drug war in in Mexico and in Central America and Colombia and how many people have died because of this drug war and how these ideas and these these uh, policies are driven by. Um, a U.S. militarism. I know I'm getting to the maybe very lofty terms, but in, in in the end, you know, it's people in power who think they have all the answers, but they don't listen to those people that are being affected by that. Um, and we share those. I think as um, as brown folks and as black folks, we share in the, the the repercussions of those policies. And I think that I think my my perspective is those international. Um, problems created by white supremacy and U.S. militarism, I think, should also be part of the conversation, or should be a greater part of the conversation. Not that they're not there, but I think that could be also become part of it. Alicia, I know, I mean, you and I are both African-American, but I know 
in your current uh, position, you work in a very diverse, uh, diverse uh, environment. You, you're around a lot of different types of people. Do you have conversations with people from from either from neither black nor white? That feel do they feel do you under, do you think that they feel like their vantage point is included in the national discussion? You know, I don't know because I think that no matter how much or how far the conversation evolves, we always have room for improvement, ways to grow. Um, and I'm actually learning a lot about. Um, my friends that are not black or white and just, you know, how they view the issues um, and things that are going on. And I feel very fortunate to have these great friends um, simply because it's a learning experience, you know, on top of just being someone's friend, like genuinely. Um, and being in a place like Boston, it's interesting as well because while I am black, I've oftentimes had, you know, um, people that are native Spanish speakers walk up to me and ask for directions or help. And because I have awesome friends that are fluent in Spanish, I've been able to help, you know, a little bit. Um, my Spanish is awful because it has the Southern, you know, twang that I, I have. Um, but that also speaks to just, you know, the world itself. Like uh, Marcos, uh, just talking about you know your experience, and then like I've met so many uh, Afro Latina, Latina, uh, while living in the Northeast, and it's just it's fascinating. Um, it's fascinating. And then, in short, Kevin, I really don't have an answer. I really don't. <laughs> but. It is interesting to learn from others. Okay. And it's okay. my job, you know, as a, I'm not gonna be as great of a scientist as I could be if I don't try to learn. And in the, the conversations that I've been having in various places, um, they talk about how racism, like, it actually, does detrimental things to the white community because it's like you're squandering, you know, genius of those that don't look like you. Um, and then, like, there are things that, you know, could be improved for them if they were to just, you know, just open your mind a little bit, expand. Let's see, Ebony and Ivory, huh? Ebony and Ivory. Ebony. Hey, Stevie, what the hell are we beating around the bush for? This is 1982. Let's get right to the point, huh? Here, take it from the tops. Swing it, Stevie, with a bounce, baby. You are black. I am white, life son Eskimo pie. Let's take a bite. That was groovy, thinking, Lincoln, when you set them free. We all know cats are the same, ain't to Mexico. Good. Bad guys and chicks. I am dark and you are light. You are blind as a bat. <laughs> I have sight. Side by side, you are my amigo. Negro, let's not fight. Heavenly That's and good. ivory, just living in perfect harmony. We're talking salt and pepper. Oh. Sammy and B. Oh. Stevie and me are peachy king. You are white. You are black. And the who cares? <laughs> who cares, baby? So anyway, we have been on for an hour. The conversation has been outstanding. If anyone wants to continue the conversation with us, all you have to do is get on social media, but please include the hashtag Think Tank 309, Think Tank 309, and hopefully we can keep the conversation going. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being a part of this awesome conversation, but before we go, I want to go back to something that JC said, because I think it's important, and I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I want to end on that, is what is the best, what has been, what has been, or what do you think would be the best way 
to kind of organically build relationships between the races so that, you know, at least coming up or, you know, coming into adulthood, people have more of a perspective that includes kind of how people from other races feel about certain things. Honestly, I would just say, like, I don't think there's a right answer to that, but I would say, at least from a white perspective, it would be um, just shedding your sort of, um, like you're offended, like someone's attacking you because of something. Just like shed your sort of like ego, shed your like sort of like, I'm offended, just stop and just listen. And actually do more than just listen, ask someone. Like try to find out like what you don't know. Like go out and actually be active in trying to understand someone else's perspective that you don't know because you've never been forced to know. So just go over and just be open-minded and ask. And I guess on top of that, I would say, but then don't ask that person to solve your guilt. So don't like force that person to be like, make me feel better about the fact that I'm racist or make me feel better about the fact that I don't know what I don't know. Like, don't don't force them that person to then be like almost consoling you because I didn't know I was still racist. Can you help me? Like, just honestly, simple, just be more open-minded, try to understand. And again, all it is is just be more sympathetic because you can't be empathetic if you haven't gone through it. So just be sympathetic, simple as that. And what I like to add to it is that um, instead of making race the sort of primary issue, is to think about your hobbies and things that you like, things that interest you, and let that lead the way so that that's the primary thing that organically can connect you to others. Um, I gave a lecture a few couple of years ago, and a student asked, um, she said, you know, I'm not great at networking, small talk. I'm not good at that. You know, how can I improve? I'm like, go to events that interest you. Things that you know a lot about. Things that excite you, that you want to talk about. And you can talk about those things with anyone. Because you're going to find that you'll be more excited about the issues or whatever um, interest you have than saying, oh, I'm not going to talk to that person because they may be very different from me or not well for me. I'd say two things, and to piggyback on what Elise just said, which was kind of brilliant, is that I think that we've forgotten also who our heroes are, you know, in, in that we don't, I mean, when you think about who in literature or who in your movies do you love and identify with, those people are not normally racist. Even if you are a racist, you're not identifying with the racist in the in the movie, you know, when you watch, I mean, at least I don't, I don't think, I mean, who, who does that? So you're living automatically a disconnect from, from the heroes that you have and the role models that you have. And the two things, and the second thing would be just to vote. I think that that is, you know, if you want to solve a lot of problems, people need to vote. I mean, straight up, I mean, for a race, color, creed, vote. Because there's, there's no there's no easier access to the mechanisms of power. Even as corrupt as we think the voting might be, there is just no easier access to that. And it happens every year, every two years, every four years. Vote down ticket. I mean, it, these things are so important and they're so underemphasized, even as we think that they are emphasized, not enough. I'll conclude by saying it like this. What I think um, needs to happen, um, I, I want to take a little bit of what Bill said um, and, you know, just be a little bit more open-minded. Um, I, 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 I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Um, I have a quote that someone told me one time that I now use. Uh, this was originally about religion. Now it can be put in for race that it fits perfectly, which is, um, I guess people, and I'm talking everybody, um, talking about race, 
Uh, we all need to kind of just take the mentality of nobody has all the puzzle pieces, but we all have a piece to the puzzle, if that makes sense. So that, that's kind of, I, I mean, that's, a, that's now a saying that I live and die by. Um, and so when you take that into consideration, um, it kind of forces you to actually, you need to be a little bit more open-minded. I need to be a little bit more open-minded, every single person. Uh, for, for race to progress, we all have to be a little bit more open-minded. So I, I guess that, that, that I'll leave it there. I'm just reminded of one, one of my, um, she's one of my heroes. She was no perfect person, but um, I really love Dorothy Day. She started the Catholic worker movement in New York. It was a house of hospitality, and what she would do was invite her neighbors to um, to an open table, open table fellowship. So, if something practical and simple is to invite people of different backgrounds and races to have a meal together, maybe once a month. I, I mean, that's um, people you barely know, or would like to know more, or you know already, and and sharing a meal and talking about things or different issues. I think that's um, one very small and practical approach to to understanding and de developing relationships. I think that's the primary concern for me is um, relationships are key. Bill, Mark, Key, A. Doug, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Whittington, JC, I appreciate all of you, all of my brothers and sisters. I appreciate you all for being a part of this conversation. I am Kevin Smith, I'm the media director of Area 309, and thank you for watching the Big Time.